You are now tuning in to the Bodybuilding Lifestyle Podcast, the number one source for unfiltered truth in bodybuilding with your host, Elon Muscular. This podcast is sponsored by Market Rex, web design and marketing automation for online coaches. If you're an online coach that is operating out of your Instagram DMs, a Google form on your link tree, or worse, a Gmail link in your bio, you're leaving a ton of money on the table. Maybe you have a website, but it kind of sucks and it's not integrated into a greater marketing strategy. Think about all the clients who would be interested in working with you, but haven't quite crossed the line of contacting you because you have not made the process smooth enough for them. At MarketRex, we create high converting websites, landing pages, lead magnets, and email marketing flows to help online coaches get more clients on autopilot so that you can focus on serving your clients and doing what you love. Head over to marketrex.co to book a free consultation call to learn more about how we can help scale your coaching business. What is up, guys, and welcome back to the Bodybuilding Lifestyle Podcast, episode 18. I'm here with Tracy Eden, wellness bikini queen on Instagram. I got in touch with Tracy because I saw her in some of Tony Hughes' stories. He's been on the podcast before, and I was just like, I thought that she looked good and liked her physique, so I went to check out her page and was surprised that there's a lot of great information out there. She coaches a lot of women, obviously, in wellness and bikini, and she openly talks about PDs, SARMs. Uh, how to use them in a more healthy way for women, as well as body image issues that women face. So I just figured it would be really interesting. She's the first woman on the podcast, but I think that the industry is a big problem where, you know, we have a lot of guys coaching women. There's been a situation recently where um, they came out that this guy, Mandis, something was like, being predatory to the, you know, bikini girls that he was coaching and stuff like that. So I just want to have more women on the podcast to be able to share their perspective and talk about their side of the sport as well. So welcome to the podcast, Tracy. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So I want to jump just right into the, the first question that I would have for you, I guess. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, so you're obviously wellness bikini queen. That's a very niche name like very specific in terms of who you're targeting how did you get to that point of you know deciding that i'm only going to work with this subset of girls and how did you get into the wellness and bikini space yourself oh that's a really good question um so i work with all females so not just um wellness and bikini even though it um it does seem that way um the first client um that i turned ifbb pro was actually figure um but this year um and hopefully next year it'll be a lot of wellness and bikini girls including myself um unfortunately last year was the year that i was going to go for it but i had seven shows cancelled um but this year i'm getting on stage no matter what um so how i got into wellness uh, in the UK, well, this has been going since um, the start of 2017. So it's not as new um, for us in Europe and South America as it is in America. Um, but I loved it. Um, so the thing was, initially I wanted to do bikini. Um, but from the get go, so before I'd even lifted much, um, I'd just been doing like hit training, sprint training, athlete training. So very much like a sprinter would train. Um, and my coach, my posing coach, even my bikini maker said, you, you're carrying too much muscle for um, bikini. You've got to do figure. Um, and I really didn't want to do that in 2016. But I went ahead anyway, did figure. Um, one of the judges came up to me afterwards. Um, so I got third um, in that show. It was my first show. Um, one of the judges came up to me afterwards and said, we're launching a new category called wellness next year and you'd be perfect for it. And she showed me the photos and I was like, yes, like I totally fell in love with it. Um, so yeah, for me, um, the female aesthetics, um, when it comes to bikini and wellness in particular is like such a passion of mine. Um, because I see a lot of people, um, well, women in particular, trying to get really big and not paying attention to shape, um, try doing all these kinds of like 
squats and deadlifts, which are great, but not applying it in a way that's keeping their waist small, um, that's taking any account of their proportions and what have you. Um, so I'm someone who has a really, really um, fine detail for, for building their body in a specific way. Um, and I think it really shows in what my client results look like too. So I, when I was on your page, I saw some of your client results and everybody looks great. And I saw that you do, you were doing like a lot of functional training, a lot of training with uh, bands and like, you know, those booty bands and stuff like that. I know that a lot of guys, you know, you always see guys like male fitness coaches posting and being like, Hey girls want to know how to grow a booty, just do squats. That's how we've been doing it since, you know, a hundred years and stuff like that. What do you think about kind of like, you know, you mentioned different sort of training modalities for women. Do you think that women need to train differently than men in order to get kind of that bikini or wellness or figure shape? Or do you think that they could just do basic bodybuilding exercises and it'll be genetics that makes them look the way that they look? That's such a good question because I think a lot of people, uh, the UK particularly, a little bit further behind in terms of... Uh, um, training specifically for women because a lot of the coaches are bodybuilders who don't really have a passion for bikini that's just where the money is whereas in the US you see they're a little bit well they're a lot further ahead in that they're so catered to like building that champion physique for a woman where you see a lot of kind of programs that are really focused on shaping certain part of the glute on one day the hamstrings on another day bringing in the waist all of these kind of things that come together to create that look so i don't think women should be training like men training like men is really limiting your 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 potential um because whilst men can lift heavier they need longer rest periods women can train with more intensity they can train with higher reps women um don't need as much rest, we recover aerobically quicker. So if you're training like a man, taking the rest periods like a man, um, going for just kind of strength and heavy lifting, when your body has much more of a capacity to lift for more reps and take shorter breaks, then you're actually limiting yourself. Um, we do find that a lot of kind of, um, not, I won't say male coaches, because I think that's unfair, um, but uh, the more kind of traditional old school coaches, they typically say things like, you only need to squat to build legs. And that is so untrue. Um, that was the philosophy I was following from my first coach, who was an old school bodybuilder. Um, and I did not have glutes. I was flat as a pancake. Um, so I reached out for loads of help um, in a female bodybuilding forum. And they said, um, look up Brett's, I'm going to say his name wrong, Contreras. Um, and I did, and I never looked back. So the key difference is that um, I told my coach I was doing like uh, three days a week and doing glutes um, four days a week. He's like, that's crazy. You need to do the traditional bro split. The bro split worked for me because I have good genetics. But when I implemented Brett's routine of training the glutes, four days a week, isolating them, doing hip thrusts. So heavy, um, medium rate, accessory work. So it's kind of mixing it up throughout the week, hitting legs three times a week. The differences were crazy. And we're talking about naturally as well, because don't forget some of the results that you see online, they're not always natural. And I'm not claiming to be natural. I'm talking about back in the day <laughs> when I first started wellness. Um, so yeah, there are so many differences between men and women and we should really be kind of um, celebrating and exploring how we push ourselves as women rather than trying to follow the routines of men just because that information has been out there longer. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And 
I, th- I mean, it definitely makes sense to me. I don't coach any women right now because honestly, I, there's a lot that I don't know about coaching women. And I, I wouldn't want to, like I said, take a woman on and then coach her like I would a man and give her the routine that I would, you know, a guy. And, you know, in the past, I've always made fun of my girlfriend for training in like, you know, that fashion, like doing those booty band stuff and stuff like that. I'm always, I would always ask her, you know, why don't you just squat with me and stuff like that. But while training with her, I noticed that, you know, like you said, she had to take shorter rest periods. She was always ready to go. And I thought it was because she had a lot of enthusiasm for training or whatever. But then I realized that it really was the fact that she was recovering a lot quicker because like you said, she's smaller, the weights that she's lifting aren't as large compared to her body weight even really. So I just felt like intuitively, she kind of understood that you know, going that super heavy, high intensity, like sort of training wasn't really what was like making her, I guess, enjoy training. I mean, the results are definitely there, but I think that for a woman, like you said, like there isn't a different aspect of shaping and this is bodybuilding after all, not just, you know, lifting as heavy as you can. So I guess that brings me to my next question. Do you think, and it might be a little counterintuitive, but you, you talked about uh, building the legs, especially you know, do you think that any of the things that you do with your female clients that a male could actually incorporate to get better legs or, or do you think that there's anything that you do with the female clients in terms of like band work or, you know, plyometrics or, you know, explosive training or whatever that a guy could use? Yeah, but I wouldn't say bodybuilding. Um, I would say definitely for men's physique because like, men's physique you see a lot of people kind of training like bodybuilding and while it is bodybuilding it's still that athletic look um so you want to be doing things like um like if you're doing sprinting functional training functional training I actually hate that word um while I do a lot of kind of hit stuff like box jumps and um using the assault bike it burns calories. Um, you're using your fast twitch muscle fibers. It's helping you build muscle in different ways as well as burning fat. And it's also far less boring than treadmill as well. There's a lot of people, um, especially the old school way. Um, and again, I think this could be more of a European thing because I follow a lot of the um, IFBB figure pros, the Olympians, like people like um, Whitney Jones, and I see them doing the battle ropes, like former Miss Miss, um, Olympia figure, current Miss Olympia figure. Um, I see them all doing the sorts of training that I do. Um, You see them doing sled pushes, using the assault bike, battle rope, flipping tires, um, and they look phenomenal, but you don't really see men doing that kind of stuff. And when you think about um, how much, the, the calories that you burn during hit versus the calories you burn during less, you can save yourself so much time on prep by incorporating hit three times a week rather than doing an hour on the treadmill. So I think one of the things with prep is that um, time management is really important um, because it can be so time consuming and energy consuming and you just get exhausted. So if I can burn 500 calories in 30 minutes rather than in 50 minutes on the treadmill, I'm always gonna take that option. If it's improving my athletic performance as well, then yeah, it it just seems like a no brainer to me. Um, But yeah, I definitely think men could use that a lot. But the main thing is that though I'm not heavily reliant on bands, I do focus a lot on time under tension and making sure that the muscle is fully engaged. So in that respect, sometimes you see women lifting slightly lower weights than they could manage, but they're using a band, for example, in the hip thrust to make sure um, that their glutes are fully engaged throughout the rep. And sometimes they're only focusing on the the kind of the mid to up range um, of the rep keeping that tension and that squeeze on and focusing on engaging, um, using a lot of the kind of mind to muscle um, aspect. And sometimes men lose that a lot with just focusing on progressive overload and just ego 
you're lifting and lifting as heavy as you can you see the form going you don't see the squeeze the contractions so all of that kind of pulling it back occasionally focusing on the tempo the tension the quality of the rep um that kind of kind of smarter stuff rather than just like tearing a bicep because you're not thinking and just going too heavy um so yeah i think that's that's one thing that male um men's physique or men in general could um, benefit from i wouldn't comment on bodybuilding because really that's just not my place um i love to watch it but i don't know enough about um the way that bodybuilders train I think that the real hardcore bodybuilders, you know, it's such a delicate equation that you can't afford to have anything like, you know, go like you can't even really try to experiment because it is so extreme. Like you have to stay within this very specific parameters in terms of what you do and eat and stuff like that. So I think that that's why, you know, the old guard and kind of that old way of thinking has is still around because it's hard to change bodybuilding. It's hard to get to that level without doing the fundamentals for so long until it's like drilled in your head. But I like to see more guys like the, you know, fitness influencers, men's physique guys, like you said, even classic physique guys doing different types of training and showing that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get a great physique. It's not just, you know, just, you know, your basic hardcore bodybuilding stuff. So I think that's really good advice. So in terms of diet, do you think that there's a, you know, the basic bodybuilding diet, fitness guy, diet for a guy that I prescribe and that, you know, pretty much everybody that I talk to likes is, you know, uh, medium to high carbs, like two grams per pound or more, uh, one gram per pound protein or more up to two grams and the fats like about one gram per kilo or less. Would you have that kind of macro breakdown for females? Or do you think that there's a different way to break down macros uh, for females as opposed to guys? What is up, guys? And thank you so much for listening to the Bodybuilding Lifestyle Podcast. If you're interested in transforming your body and getting shredded this summer, I put together an awesome free 30-minute mini course called Shredded Secrets of Fitness Influencers that you can grab at elonmuscular.com or visit the link in the description of this podcast. This is real, raw, true information that you won't find anywhere else. Head over to elonmuscular.com slash shredded to check it out right now. Oh, so it really depends on the female. Um, one of the things where it's trickier with women is that um, men are so lucky, your hormones are generally stable, whereas ours change throughout the month due to, to periods, stress, age, all kinds of things. Um, so we get a lot of issues with kind of bloating, fat storage. So if you're higher in estrogen, you're going to have trouble shifting fat around the hips because that's where it's naturally stored. Um, so what I like to do with women, because um, fats really help the body regulate our hormones, and that's one of the biggest things in managing um, kind of weight loss and performance for women is managing our hormones. Um for that reason, I tend to use a higher fat diet. Um, so depending on how much the woman weighs, it's generally um, one gram of fat per kilo um, for the woman. Um, so typically people are on 55 to 80 or 90 grams of um, fat. So for example, I'm, I'm 83 kilos, I eat around 80 grams of fat. Um, so with that in mind, carbs are typically a little bit lower, um, but it kind of depends. I play around with it. So I start with one and a half grams per, uh, sorry, two grams per kilo. And then I either kind of taper up or taper down. Um, and then protein tends to be um, the, the, the typical. So 1.2 to 1.5 um, grams per pound. So I've just mixed pounds and kilos there because I tend to work with like a lot of um, American and British clients. So I'm always flipping between the two. So when it gets late in the day, I do start. <laughs> Me too. With the, especially with the ounces and the grams. It's like I send all my plans with cups and ounces because I'm American. And like, then the people will message me back and be like, I literally have no idea what, you know, an ounce is or what any of this is. And I'm just like, okay, so just do the conversion yourself. 
Because I don't know, I don't want to accidentally give them the wrong, you know what I mean? Because I don't really know about about like measuring in, in grams and stuff like that. But sometimes I'll look online and try to do the, the conversions. But I noticed that in bodybuilding, it's pretty standard to talk in cups and ounces because a lot of it started in America and, and also in pounds. Um, but I guess it, it depends. So I guess that brings me, okay. So it seems like the macros are pretty similar. Um, maybe fats a little bit higher for a, for a female. I know some guys have, it's not like crazy high fats you're talking about. It's pretty normal. Some guys run the fats higher like that too. It just really depends. Uh, I like lower fat, but I think that guys with uh, faster metabolisms uh, do better with a little bit more fat. Um, I want to ask you something about something you brought up the, uh, the, the cycle, right? The female hormone cycle. Do you design your training and diet around that cycle? Like, does that play into account when you, you know, make your plans at all? Or how does that even work? Because I honestly know absolutely nothing about it. And probably most guys watching this show. No, even it doesn't. It's <laughs> Oh, it's frozen. No, I'm back. I'm back. Um, yeah, that's actually one of my, my pet peeves because I've seen a couple of coaches do it. Um, they've they've been two British coaches again where they've kind of it's clear they've just gone on Wikipedia or WebMD um spouted some nonsense about the female luteal cycle and how you must feel how you feel weaker and therefore you must know if you feel you are physically able to train which most women are then you should absolutely train nothing should hold you back um from training because every training day every rest day is vital especially when you're training for um a competition or even in your off season if you're building um if you need to go lighter um on that day for discomfort or whatever um, and then do so I generally advise to do so because sometimes you can get muscle aches but um, every woman is different um, but no I certainly don't really take that into account um, in terms of hormones the only thing I do take into account is um, sometimes when a woman is going through that so this is for the master's clients who are the 45 to 50s range where they do have a lot of fluctuation um, there's either diminishing natural testosterone or raising estrogen levels that's causing severe bloating and um, energy reduction. Um, so I, I tend to get them to check their hormones. I like to get everyone to check their hormones anyway, so that we've got a baseline. Um, so I remember in the early days where we'd get to kind of you'd have like one or two clients who swore they were doing everything right um, and you know the results weren't coming then you get them to do a baseline check and there'd be something wrong with their thyroid these days I want to know up front that your hormones are in a good spot um, before we even kind of go ahead um, so that's the only kind of um, instances where I do take into account the female cycle um, we are so much stronger um, than we think so I hate when I see people kind of in people who have never had periods uh, <laughs> kind of recommending that you don't train during your period I'm like what the hell do you know about that uh, <laughs> and I've really kind of been like kind of sat there listening to this guy I'm like what the you just read this online five minutes ago no um so yeah that's, that's one of my pet peeves Okay. I'm glad that you could come on and debunk that because I was, I saw a few of these guys while, you know, looking at like, you know, some girls profiles on Instagram, like, wow, this girl looks good. And then she's talking about her coach and then finding a lot of these coaches that coach, you know, mostly girls and bikini and, and stuff like that. And then, because I was interested to learn more about how to coach women myself, because I don't want to jump into it in a irresponsible way, but I would like to start taking on all kinds of clients. And, um, Oh yeah. A lot of them were taught. Some of them even had like, you know, free, uh, you know, video, if you give them your email or like a, you know, lead magnet, some, something like that, like, uh, how to, you know, train around your cycle. And these are male coaches talking about how it's like really important to understand this stuff. And I thought that these guys are like, maybe they're really smart and know something that I don't know. And I was even thinking to myself, like, 
wow, I must have been giving some girls in my life like, uh, you know, bad fitness advice because I never took this into account when designing, you know, talking about training or, 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 or program or anything like that. But it's good to hear from you that it's bullshit because I, it sounded like bullshit to me too. Like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like you're supposed to obviously push yourself as hard as you can whenever you do train. If you can't train because you're sick, then you can't train. But uh, it didn't make sense to me logically, but they, then they seem to have all this science behind it that I don't understand. So I'm like, all right, well, this guy seems to know what he's talking about, but okay. So that was definitely one of my big questions. Yeah. But it's good to know. Okay. That's so, the thing. Like a lot of people, well, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, go on, go on. Yeah, like I do see a lot of people kind of bullshit with the kind of science rather than practicality or um, experience because it does kind of hook new newer competitors in. Um, but we're all individuals. So most women are perfectly able to train on their periods and train really well um, unless there's a, um, a medical condition like polycystic ovaries, like endometriosis, where you've got severe kind of period cramps and your, um, your hormones are thrown way out of whack for medical conditions. But most of us normal women, um, not normal women, but hormonally healthy women um, can absolutely train. So. Like the one thing I want to always say is never, um, especially women, because there's so much misleading information for us. Um, there's a load of people that kind of see the female competitors as just easy money, cash cows. They, they, there's that caring and understanding isn't really there. It's just a quick Google and then they regurgitate a lot of stuff that they see. So um newer competitors female competitors absolutely don't get sucked in by people dazzling you with science look at their results don't just take in clients who already look good look at their before pictures so don't forget that a lot of um uh, especially at the, the the big big teams they sponsor athletes that look amazing already because that's the best selling point you want to know who coaches um top five olympians you go onto their page and you see it's it's the same guy you're gonna go and sign up with that person um but these girls change coaches every six months to a year so it's all about sometimes the highest bidder sometimes there's that good relationship there and most of these coaches are fantastic but the best coach for you is always going to be someone who has time to develop you if you're a newbie um, and who has taken people who look like your current state into what you would look like, not just a load of people who already look phenomenal, if that makes sense. Okay, awesome. So, you know, piggybacking off the, the hormone conversation for women, I want to touch on, you know, performance enhancements for women and how they affect female hormones down the line, because I think this is something that is a huge, huge question mark. And a lot of women have taken steroids for a long time, you know, since the seventies and eighties. And there's so many horror stories of, you know, female bodybuilders from the past that now basically accidentally you know, did, so, did something permanently that changed the way that their hormones work and, and how they look. And I feel like not a lot of people understand how this works. So as a guy, you know, when we take testosterone or we take something from outside, I believe that we will never produce testosterone at the same level again, it permanently changes us. And that like, you can't basically come off anyone that I've ever seen to try to come off as a guy, like actually PCT and come off has been in worse shape after that process than before they ever took anything. So I think that for a guy, it's really a, you know, lifetime commitment if you do want to get on and uh, you're going to basically be on TRT forever at that point. As a woman, what do you think is the way to approach, like, how do you approach um, like performance enhancing? I, I've heard some uh, coaches talk about setting a testosterone base, even as a woman, like a small testosterone base. Uh, if, if, if a girl comes to you and says, I want to do like, let's say a bikini show, I know everyone's different, but what kind of compounds, you don't have to talk about dosages, but would you generally use and what would you completely steer clear from for a woman? 
Um, so it depends on the category. Um, for bikini, I've never prepped anyone on um, gear slash steroids. It's totally unnecessary for bikini. Um, I know a few people do it. Uh, a few people use clan, etc. cetera. Um, but steroids, testosterone, all of those things are always, in my opinion, unnecessary for bikini for this very one reason. If as a woman, you're unable to build enough muscle and get lean enough for bikini, then you shouldn't be competing. Because the main reason that women get so fucked up, sorry, am I, am I allowed to swear? I'll try not to. Um, you're not allowed not to swear. The main reason people... <laughs> 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 the main reason women mess themselves up in um in this industry is because they want to go and do too much too soon if your diet and training isn't right adding in gear is not going to do that much for you all you're going to do is want to take more and more um to get results that you could be getting from having um a proper training and nutrition plan. Bikini is hard, but it is 100% naturally um, achievable. The problem is two things. Instagram, people think these results are overnight. People think that this isn't as hard as it is. It is so hard to prep for a show, no matter like what category you're doing. And people say bikini is easy it's not easy it's tough but instagram makes it seem really accessible and easy for everyone so they're not necessarily aware of how much work it takes but also not everyone is going to be the top of their class at school and likewise not everyone is cut out genetically for bodybuilding so if you've always naturally been a bit kind of doughy I don't know well you find it naturally hard to put on muscle you find it really hard to shift weight your diet and training is fantastic bodybuilding probably isn't you know going to be the best for you because you've got to remember there's people with a1 genetics a1 work rate um sponsorships um everything those people are always going to get to the top because they have the work ethic they've got um the money behind them um they're also on performance enhancers and then there's, there's you who can't put on enough muscle for bikini without gear trying to compete up here people just need to learn when to take an l not because it's um it's seen as a failure or what have you, but try to, at amateur level, do things that top pros are doing without any real chance of, of getting anywhere with it is only going to damage your health. Um, so that's the first thing is that I'd say bikini um, gear is totally unnecessary unless you've had a hormone check and your testosterone is naturally too low for a female, you have thyroid issues um, or something that can be corrected um, at holistic level and not steroid level. So if your thyroid is not functioning well for a normal person, you would raise that. If we're talking about the bodybuilding level, you would go above that to help you burn fat. Um, but then obviously you'd have to put in um, like a little bit of anavar to mitigate uh, muscle loss because um, adding in T3, which would be prescribed by your doctor if you had a thyroid issue, um, can cut through fat and muscle indiscriminately, especially towards the end of prep when you're um, doing lots of cardio, your calories are really low. Um, with figure, it, again, it depends on the client and their goals. If they're going for um, NPC um, and they're wanting to go pro, um, they have the potential to go pro. Um, and there's just a little, they're wanting to go to that next level. Um, then for me, um, the recommendation is to always start light. If you've never used gear before, 
a little bit goes a long way. Um, now, people's interpretation of a little bit is it really varies from person to person. <laughs> but there's crazy stuff I've seen. Like um, two years ago, there was this big kind of um, exposure of a British coach who had been giving his um, females um, Tran to prep on. And we're talking about bikini girls never competed before, so novice. This is an absolute no-no. When you're going for um, steroids as a female, you want to go for the ones on the lowest androgenic scale. Um, so this is your Anavan, your Winstrol, and you don't want to be taking more than 10 milligrams a day, especially if you've never used before. Um, so get diet and training right get that kind of process going once you see the results the adding in the performance enhances does exactly that it enhances that performance if your baseline performance isn't good times in zero by zero isn't going to get you very far so everyone should really just kind of get the elements right um as you see a lot of people kind of say after a show, oh, it's because she was on gear why she won. And actually it's not. Like she won simply because she was better. Um, le bodybuilding isn't a level um, playing field at all. Um, we're not starting with the same kind of genetic capacity, uh, muscle maturity. There's so many differentiators um, between our starting points. Um, and people think that gear um, plays so much more of a part than it actually does. A lot is achievable naturally, especially for a female. Okay, that was, that was a lot and definitely makes sense. And I've seen a lot of, you know, girls that compete at the Olympia and stuff like that to, uh, in bikinis specifically talk about how they're natural and get like a lot of bullshit for it. And people, you know, all the, all the time calling them out that they're lying and stuff like that. But then you look at the girl and it's like, I don't know, it's like not really, I don't really see uh, why this girl would would have to be taking steroids really to look like that. You know, there's, a, I've seen a college athletes, uh, like I remember in my school, there was a really good soccer team where I went to college and some of the girls were fucking jacked and some of the girls were not jacked, but they didn't even really work out. It just really was, uh, you know, genetics and playing sports and they looked athletic, like they could probably get on the bikini stage. So I feel like a lot of the time, especially for women, like people forget about genetics like, I feel like with the guys, it's like, we, we kind of already know because we've seen so many, like throughout history, so many different guys, so many different genetics and stuff like that. So many different guys lifting, but for females, this it's pretty new, you know, this whole sport and everything like that. Um, so I feel like girls don't necessarily understand, you know, the, the genetic aspect for a, for a woman. And they think that it's all drugs and stuff because you're making yourself muscular, right? So they assume that taking male hormones will make you muscular. And that's kind of where the issues are, you know, because when the more male hormones you start to take to get more muscular, the more masculine you're going to get. And you're trying to balance that. So I think it's very hard for women to uh, find that balance. And then the girls who have to take more to get to the same level, lose the femininity. And then they complain that they lost because they're not feminine enough. But then why did you take all those steroids if you wanted to be feminine? It doesn't make sense. Right. So so um, my question and for what, like, why do these women, sorry, go on. Uh, yeah, it makes no sense to me to ruin your, your not, it's not just your femininity, your beauty, because that's in the, the eye of the beholder, but your fertility, your long term health as well. For what, like, it makes no sense for me as a coach. Um, uh, and I'm talking specifically as um, it, with the bikini class is that I have girls who bust their asses to look fantastic and girls who cheat on their diet, miss training, um, kind of give up halfway through, take a week off, come back, get on stage and win because they look good with a little bit of work. Um, meanwhile, the person next to them has busted their ass. It is not fair. 
but some people just have an easy time with it. Um, and I guess as a competitor, you don't see that, but as a coach, you do. And I, you just think this lucky, this lucky son of a... <laughs> like they have no idea like how much work I would have to do to get as lean as she would. Like there's things you see as a coach that kind of... Um, help you understand you know even more when you see how um, differently other people's bodies work to yours so yeah there's a really appreciate you tuning in to this episode of the bodybuilding lifestyle podcast i wanted to take this chance to tell you about my one-on-one -on -one coaching program physique mastery coaching if you ever wanted to work with me directly this is the best way to do it we have coaching plans for all income levels starting from 99 dollars a month as well as one-off calls where i create a lesson plan custom tailored to your unique situation we talk a lot about hardcore performance enhancing drugs on this podcast, as well as advanced diet and training principles. Don't waste your precious time, energy, or health learning how to implement all this on your own. Get in touch with me and I will guide you on a straight path to your physique goals. Check out elonmuscular.com to book a free physique mastery consultation call with me. Saying like that the best coaches are the ones that actually aren't that good at what they're coaching themselves because we have to try to figure out how to maximize what we do have. So it's like in that process, you learn so much that somebody that naturally is good at something does not learn. And then when you apply that knowledge to someone that does have the genetics, then they end up looking better than you like so fast. And I've had this experience too. And then, but you know, sometimes I, in the beginning, when I first started training people and saw some, some guys with great genetics results, I would be jealous, like, oh my God, how does this guy, you know what I mean? Like he's already doing this and it's only been six months. Like what the hell? And then, there's, <laughs> <laughs> but then there's other guys on the other side of it though, where it's like, Jesus Christ, the amount of food that this guy has to eat and he's not growing, like this is crazy. So, I mean, it really, I feel like, you know, for me and you, the, the type of um, mindset that I get from you is like, you know, average or like slightly above average um, sort of genetics and response and stuff like that. And I feel like that gets, that makes a good coach because we can show that we do know what we're doing in a sense, but then at the same time, like there are people who are a lot better. So my next question for you would be, um, so, okay. So in terms of steroids, you said like, obviously a little bit of Anavar, a little bit of Winstrol, maybe a little bit of Prima Bolin and Cleanse, something like that. Um, for in terms of SARMs, you know, SARMs is a big thing right now. And everyone says, oh, SARMs don't have any side effects. And this is something that I'm trying to kind of fight against. And there's, I don't feel like there's really a lot of voices talking about SARMs in a not good way that much in bodybuilding. But I think that for guys, like they're pretty useless. Like they, I don't really see them doing anything that steroids do with less side effects, the way that they're advertised. I've taken SARMs before and I didn't, I didn't really feel like the gains that I got for the side effects that oh, I got were any oh. better. What? Sorry, um, my connection went off a little bit. Um, could you just repeat the, um, I think you said you, do, you don't, don't feel like you got um, enough results for the side effects that you got. Was that what you said? Well, in terms of SARMs, I just feel like they're marketed like this thing, like you're going to get results with no side effects, right? And then from the research I've seen in my personal experience and talking to a lot of guys, it they give you results and they also give you side effects the same way that steroids would really. So I don't really see like how magic, how magical they are and why they're changing. But I do see people selling them like crazy and pushing them on people because they're legal and you can like buy them way easier and stuff like that. So I just feel like it's kind of like a false, it's become kind of like a false thing. Like so many guys DM me and say, oh, I've been taking, you know, LGD, RAD 140, this, that. I still don't look the way that I want to look. Why? And I'm like, because they sold you the SARMs under a false pretense. Like you thought that you were going to get these crazy results on them because they're like steroids without the side effects. But really, it's like you thought that you were going to take something that was going to change your body, but like you don't have the diet and training and you just thought that SARMs were going to be the solution and you still got all the side effects. So basically you just fucked yourself up for no reason. Like there was no benefit to taking these. 
Um, that's how I feel about it personally. Um, but I have heard a lot of guys say, and a lot of top coaches say that SARMs are really good for women because they don't have androgenic side effects. You know, they're selective and they help build muscle. So do you use SARMs in your female clients and have you seen any androgenic side effects with SARMs in females? Um, so everything that I do is always at low dose anyway, if we are using performance enhancing. Um, so with SARMs, the two um, that I do use um, for a small percentage um, is MK677 and Cardarine. Um, and I found them to be pretty effective. Um the MK677 generally is what would be used in an off season because it can increase hunger. Um, but if you think about SARMs versus steroids, if you've used steroids, it's SARMs are always going to be disappointing <laughs> at the end of the day because steroids are like a Ferrari and SARMs are like... Uh, I don't know, like a, a Ford Fiesta. Both are gonna, <laughs> one's gonna get you where you wanna go real quick. The other will, it will, will trot along kind of nicely. Um, so the, the two can't really be compared, but with um, MK677, um, if, you're, if you're somebody who doesn't want to use growth hormones, but you but you want the benefit from it without spending all of that money, without injecting yourself. Um, does it work as well? No, um, but it does really work. So personally, I used it for the first time last year um, and found it was brilliant. Um, so I immediately noticed um, like my abs getting tighter and leaner, my six pack more defined. Um, and that's typically what I would see on low dose GH. Um, sleep was improved. Um, all of these things. Um, will it improve my um, my muscle mass? We're going to see. Um, like I'm going to be 12 weeks out on Saturday. So I'm just at the start of a cut. Um, so it's really the proof in the pudding right now. But the results I've seen off season. Um, have been really good. Um, Cardarine in terms of energy and fat burning, um, really good as well. Um, but both of these, we're, we're talking about the minimal dosages. Um, would I want to play around and do more? Definitely not, um, because that's not something I would do with um, steroids, let alone SARMs. Um, because that research isn't there like it's not been there for long enough like steroids have um, but then you've got people like Tony Huge who you know there's people doing all kinds of experiments and putting their body through all types of things so I'm always asking them questions and you know talking about their results and this is a, a good kind of 20 or so people you don't have women doing this because women are not dumb but thankfully a lot of men are so we can take our learning from them um so that's generally what i do yeah so i i you know i i love tony uh he's a really good guy he's a friend of mine but um you know the, the things that he does are clearly not responsible you know what i mean so as a coach i would not recommend them to people but he's not a coach so he has the freedom to do and say whatever he wants to say and that's fine i don't necessarily even disagree with what he's saying or think that he sh that he shouldn't say any of the things that he does no say me neither science. yeah exactly like as long as people i love it because he's willing to do yeah he's willing to do what i'm not and it it helps us learn you know just you know how far can you push the, the human body without doing it yourself um because as a woman there are less we have to take less risks anyway um because you know our our outward appearance is can be damaged in a way that a man's can't be, let alone all of the internal um, effects as well. So yeah, thank God for people like Tony, because um, I certainly won't ever be doing that myself, but what a great resource to be able to learn, um, especially Psalms when it's just so like new. 
Okay, awesome. So th this brings me to my probably one of my last enhancement questions, but I have so many um, about women and enhancing because there's just been so much stuff that I've heard over the years that, you know, I've never had the chance to sit down and talk to somebody to really clear it up that's an expert. Um, so in terms of growth hormone, you mentioned pharmaceutical growth hormone, right? Um, I've heard on both sides. I've heard some people say that women need less growth hormone because they're smaller and they're more responsive to it. And people saying, oh, one to two I use and a girl will go a really long way. And I've heard other people say that there's actually some scientific research behind the fact that women are actually more resistant to growth hormone than men and need more to get the same results than a man would need to get because of some kind of, I don't know, convert, way that they converted in their body. I don't know anything about, you know, either of those things really. So I wanted to ask you, what kind of dosages of pharmaceutical growth hormone do you think are, are good for a woman? Do you think that they need to take more to get the same results? Or do you think that like one to two I use is a good dosage? No, so for me, I'd say um, uh, between one and three is a good dosage. I tend to take two, um, but it, it really depends on the female um, and what class you're doing. So I would imagine that if you're doing women's physique or women's bodybuilding, you're going to be up using what the men would use. Um, but wellness and figure, there's absolutely no reason to go beyond two, three or even four. Maybe some women would do at the higher um kind of levels but growth hormone is also something that takes a long time to see the results um from as well going up really high so i think one time um i took four units and immediately found kind of swelling in the forearms in the fingers um and it, it's just not what like things like that hinder your training um, that bloat, that water retention, I can't see how that could be beneficial. Um, but at the same time, all of our bodies work slightly differently, um, but I just can't imagine any reason why a woman would need to take more um, uh, growth hormone than a man. Um, but perhaps it's the men I know because they they're taking eight to 10 units, which I, uh, that sounds like a hell of a lot to me. <laughs> so yeah, the thought of taking more than a male would is kind of like, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Gotcha. So you, you get, you see good results with, you know, normal, normal uh, growth hormone dosages. So what is your opinion just quickly? Cause I, I ask everybody this because I think this is a major epidemic on um, generic versus pharmaceutical growth hormone. Like, do you think that generic growth hormone is uh, the same quality? Is it even the same compound? Like, would you, if a girl can't uh, afford pharmaceutical, would you put them on a generic? Do you see any benefit with generic growth hormone? Yeah, like generic is, is great, but it's like everything um, in this world. Like some people make good quality stuff, some people don't. Like you really have to trust your supplier. You have to test the stuff. Like Dave Palumbo says all of the time on, on RX Muscle, um, you've got to make sure that the stuff you're buying is right, or you're gonna you're gonna be wasting your time. So there are testing kits. Um, it's, it's quite easy for us to test in Thailand. Um, and the stuff here is very good quality and ridiculously priced. I think it's about, I don't know, like a hundred pounds, which is like $130 um, for 10 units. So yeah, and we have some fantastic bodybuilders here and very little pharmaceutical is used. Okay, awesome. So next, next thing uh, I want to cover with you and, you know, we, are you good for like maybe 30 more minutes? I can, that'll be past midnight for me, but I can do like another 15 if that's okay. 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 
Um, so we covered all the bodybuilding stuff, which is awesome. And that, I, I just want, I like to get to know the guests a little bit and talk about their lifestyle as well. So I know that you're living in Thailand and you mentioned on your profile that you used to work in corporate America and then you transitioned into this coaching thing. And then, you know, now you're living abroad and stuff like that. Could you talk a little bit about why did you choose to move to Thailand? How did you kind of get to this point in your life? Because your lifestyle obviously is very unique. Um, so what inspired you to, you know, move to Thailand and to quit your job and do all these things with your life? Yeah, so mine's like a, a, a different story. Um, so at school, I was always athletic, um, you know, sprinting, all of that kind of training. Um, but then I got to my late teens and I started getting really bad kind of energy problems um, I was having trouble kind of writing and even holding a pen, that sort of thing. Um, so it turns out after years, like literally like three years. Um, so it was discovered when I was kind of 22, officially, officially diagnosed that I had sarcoidosis. Um, so it's an autoimmune condition that causes a lot of inflammation. Um, so I had muscle weakness. Um, I had the inflammation in my eyes, my heart, and my lungs. Um, I got to a stage where I had gone from incredibly active to being pretty much bed bound. And I had to take a lot of medication. Um, so a lot of prescribed steroids to get out of bed and function. Um, yeah. And during the course of the treatment, so I was on prednisone, which is a cortical steroid. Um, I'd put on 70 pounds, which is about 40 kilos, I think. Um, and at the same time, kind of working through my graduate career in communications and marketing, um, desperately wanting to get fit, but kind of feeling trapped by um, the day job and the, the low energy levels and just trying to get through life. So as soon as I was physically and financially able after kind of five years of pretty much struggling just to do my day job, um, I got into fitness, just walked into a gym, started doing the classes, um, clean eating, so not even macros, just making all of my food at home. Um, and I saw results pretty quickly. So I was getting smaller and stronger, but it was never my intention to get into bodybuilding at all. Um, kind of eight months in, I had people asking me if I was a competitor, what sport did I play, whatever. So I kind of thought, hmm, let me look into this. Um, and then it all kind of started from there. Like my friend was entering a bodybuilding competition. Um, I decided to kind of join her, prepped in six weeks, got myself a coach six weeks out. Uh, and I think there's a transformation picture where I, my coach said, I have never seen anybody transform like that, especially not naturally. So it was just something that um, I found that I really loved. I was passionate about it um, and I decided from that moment that um, I was going to use whatever spare time I could to learn as much as I could about bodybuilding, nutrition. Um, I wanted to kind of coach myself through my growth, um, learn about my body. It was never my intention to coach anyone either. Um, it's all of these things that kind of just grow through passion. So... I'm like five or six years into my career. Um, uh, so I started off in a magazine company, then went to the Estee Lauder companies, PR and marketing, working in beauty um, and all of these things. Um, still doing the bodybuilding on the side, um, training as a personal trainer, all of these things. Um, and then I had a lady ask, um, and this was four years ago. Um, so I was like, yeah, really excited about the challenge. We worked together for two years. Um, and this was the lady who turned IFBB Figure Pro as well. Um, and then from there, I started taking on more and more ladies. Um, my initial goal with helping women train was that 
I had gone from severely overweight or obese and I wanted to help women lose body fat in a really healthy way. So ditch the whole concept of dieting and just learn how to eat nutritiously according to your macros and have fun at the gym. And then it went from there to onto body building so both of these things are my passion and both of these things I incorporate in my coaching whether lifestyle or bodybuilding um but yeah it's very much grown from there and I couldn't be more grateful um Thailand is somewhere I've always wanted to live um and the plan was to move out here I haven't actually moved out here what happened was my flight home got cancelled last March and they closed the borders so that's why I'm here (laughs) so you're going on a year now of, of being stuck in Thailand yeah, I actually got here on the the 4th of November 2019 and I generally stay because um, the competitions in the UK kind of finish around late October and they start again in March. So I generally have that big holiday where I get loads of sun and escape the European winter. But yeah, I just had the longest summer ever and it's been so good. Um because I've always been that kind of person who is full on all of the time. Like when I think I've built my coaching career while working a job that was really demanding. So 60, 60 to 70 hours a week. Um, in the, the UK city like London is so fast paced, so hyper stressed. Um, And then like waking up early um, to coach clients, coaching clients late into the night, working with people in Australia and America, like different time zones, trying to kind of build enough of reputation and collection of results in order to leave the job. Um, I've never had any kind of time out until this year where I appreciated that while like, work can be so rewarding you also have to take that time out to look after yourself Um, and it's only through this whole kind of COVID pandemic that I've realized how important um, taking that time out and that rest physically and mentally is and how much better it makes you look physically and feel physically Um, because it's crazy like we tell our clients how important rest days are Meanwhile, getting four or five hours sleep, working crazy, being hyper stressed, having all of these things on your to-do list and not like taking care of yourself. That's why sometimes you see um, loads of coaches who look like absolute shit, uh, but their clients look great. And now I totally understand how that can happen. So you know, female entrepreneurship and like building a business and stuff like that is, you know, really big nowadays. And everyone is talking about kind of like being a girl boss and stuff like that. And just, you know, I feel like a lot of women are branching out and like, you know, taking ownership of their lives kind of, kind of thing recently. And it's, and it's awesome to see. So that's like, I'm inspired by, you know, you taking that, that journey in a sense, do you have any advice for, like an aspiring coach or, you know, uh, a girl who's might be listening to the podcast who maybe is a client of yours or, you know, a girlfriend of somebody that would be interested in taking a similar path to you. How, how does uh, somebody, you know, get in the position that you are to have, you know, an online business and the confidence to be able to travel the world by yourself and stuff like that. Do you have any advice for someone in that situation? Yeah, for sure. I think the number one, difference between men and women is that it's the confidence like we can be so kind of self disparaging if that's even the right word whereas I find find that men are naturally just more confident and able to sell themselves in a way that sometimes women can feel uncomfortable and you have to get out there and get into those spaces don't be afraid to use your your voice especially online like social media is huge huge um so don't be afraid to speak on um you know your passions your knowledge um 
the one good, the one big thing about social media is that, and coaching is that there's so many coaches out there. Make sure you take your time to study your craft. Make sure you have good results behind you as well. Even if you have to take on three, five clients for free, there's nothing wrong with that. Make sure that when you're taking people on, you actually know how to work with their bodies because there's nothing worse than building this great reputation without the results, people joining you with expectations, then you're unable to deliver. So start small, build that credibility, build the results, keep working on your knowledge. No matter how good you are as a coach, the minute you stop learning, talking to other people, having mentors is the minute that you're behind because this sport is always evolving and changing. There's always new things coming along like SARMs, like different forms of training. There's always people you can learn from. Um, like myself, I've, I've had kind of five coaches in my lifetime and I would say three of them absolutely incredible. The other two, um, you can also learn from people's mistakes as well. So think about what you want in a perfect coach. Uh, write all of those things down. What is important to you um, as a client? Once you have that, you're able to put yourselves in a, uh, your client's kind of shoes. Then you're able to talk to them authentically online and kind of engage and attract the right um, or the best kind of fit for you. Um, yeah, always invest in your knowledge. Don't be afraid to work with other coaches. Don't be afraid to ask for help and um, make really good connections. And the most important thing is put the work in. Don't take shortcuts. Um, even myself, I've seen um, my program or my plans um, that have been given to previous clients. They've kind of copy and pasted and given it to their own clients. And um, things like that do not work in the short term. Um, you'll only come a, a, a certain, you'll only get as far as you can by copying someone else's style. What you need to do is understand the thought process behind the plans for that particular body, for that person's goal, for that person's lifestyle. All of these different things. So invest in your knowledge, do the work. The shortcuts don't work, so don't be afraid to graft. Understand that it takes time. Like social media will have you thinking that everyone's an overnight success. Um, like I've been working towards this for five years um, and I'm still grafting. I still have like a one-year plan, three-year plan, five-year plan as to where I want to be. And I'm super excited about that. So being self-employed, you have a lot of freedom, but there's also so much risk as well. So be willing to work more than you do in your day job. If you love what you do, generally, genuinely have a passion, it won't feel like work at all. So just go for it, honestly. That's that's great advice. And you know, I, I would I would say the exact same thing. I mean really it's just about the work that you put in and how much you are willing to invest yourself. And then just hoping that people appreciate that and that you can get good results on the back end of that. And they will, if people see that, obviously you're a genuine person who wants people to get good results and you're investing in your own knowledge and how to best serve them, then that will just, you know, carry you over time and life is long and you have plenty of time to meet the people and make the connections that you need to get the clients that you want. So thanks for coming on, Tracy. I really appreciate it. I know it's late over there in Thailand. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation with you. I think we, we covered the whole gambit. Do you have any uh, closing words? Thank any... you so much for having me. Of course, of course. It was a pleasure. And uh, I would love to have you on again sometime to talk more. Um, do you have any closing words for you know anybody watching? Uh, just your message or where they can find you, pitch your coaching, whatever you want to say. Oh God, put me on the spot. <laughs> My mind's not even. <laughs> 
No, honestly, I, I, I have loved this conversation tonight because, you know, sometimes I can be so much um, in my own world and kind of doing the day to day um, that I, it's just so nice to have these conversations. If anyone is interested in wellness, female coaching, any type of question, my inbox is always open. Um, so do feel free to um, ask me any questions that you wish. I'm always looking for topics to make videos on. So you can find me on Instagram at Wellness Bikini Queen. Um, um, yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks for coming on. This is episode 18. <laughs>